freedom 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 over fame freedom freedom over f- cycle stays the same welcome first of all welcome this is unsolicited perspectives and i am your host bruce anthony thank you for listening and watching wherever you get your podcast and video podcast subscribe share like comment and rate us you can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at unsolicited underscore perspectives. You can find us on Twitter and TikTok at unsolicited underscore P-E-R. Watch us live now. Watch us live every Thursday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch and YouTube. Our audience, our audience continues to grow with each and every episode. And I humbly thank you. On today's episode, it's the 50th episode, and today's subject, me. My sister's going to be interviewing me today, but first things first. The first thing I want to do is thank everybody that's out there in the audience that's been listening and watching the podcast, 50th episode. This is a big deal. I, I didn't realize it was a big deal until uh, we got here, and it's a big deal. And we're not finished. I, we're going to do 100, and then 150, and 200. We're going to keep on going. This thing's not going anywhere. So first off, I want to say thank you. For today's 50th episode, I felt like it was important because I've done so many interviews with other people who have shared uh, personal stories and opened up, and you guys really don't know me. Even people that know me don't really know me. So this is going to be an opportunity for everybody to really get to know me, Bruce Anthony. And who better to interview me than my sister, Jay on Jay. Jay, what's up? What's up, brother? You ready for this? I mean, yeah, the way you just, the way you grinning and the way (laughs) you you, you asked that question got me a little apprehensive, but yeah, whatever. Yeah, I'm ready. This isn't gonna be a puff piece, all right? We're gonna let's, <laughs> oh, let's, Lord Jesus. <laughs> we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk okay. about it. All right. All right. All right. Well, I'm ready. So you let's ready? Hit, let's hit it. Let's hit it. Let's I go. mean, the where where else to start but the beginning? Right. right. Okay. July second, nineteen eighty. Wow, you really put my birthday out there. Like, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> like you really we get, like, <laughs> you can bleep okay. it out. You can bleep no, it out. No, I know now people that uh, that have been asking me for years, like, when is your birthday? I know it's somewhere around the 4th of July. Like, there's a lot of people that don't know when my actual They're, birth date is. The, the lack of vulnerability is that deep, Bruce? <laughs> yeah, people really don't know when my actual birth date is. But now they do. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, they July, do now. July, July 2nd. 2nd, 1980, the day after my mom's birthday. I was my mom's yes. greatest birthday gift but okay yeah my birthday yes. yeah so what are some memorable experiences from childhood and now here's what i don't want you to do okay you talk about that race you and dad had where he fell and rolled down the hill <laughs> okay <laughs> i don't want you to talk about i want something <laughs> truly a truly memorable experience that you feel like okay it really made an impact on me down the road Something that I carry with me. What is something from your early childhood? Uh, mom and dad are really? not going to like this. So we were living in Illinois mm-hmm. and we weren't living in the greatest neighborhood. I, no, we, hey guys. We, we, listen, hey, it was rough. It was rough. In early uh, years. And I'm coming out the gate full barrel uh, with this story. So mm-hmm. back behind where we live was an alley that led to a drugstore. Mm-hmm. And it was a weird drugstore. Like it was a drugstore that like doubled as a bar. And mom and dad told me never, never, ever, ever go down that alley and go to that drugstore. Mm-hmm. But me being the person that I am, why? Why can't I go? Because I said so. Wasn't a sufficient answer. Right. It never is. Never is. So I used to mm-hmm. sneak down that alley and go to the drugstore all the time. There was this one particular time there was this really foul smell. Really foul smell. Mm-hmm. Smell that I had never smelt ever in my life. So as I'm trying to hurry down the alley, uh, so mom and dad, so I can get back. So mom and dad don't know what I've done because I've stolen some pennies off of dad's dresser because he always had loose change. I look over and 
I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I later through therapy realized, saw my first dead body mm -hmm. decomposing on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's a memory that's, that's one of my earliest memories. I five, six, seven years old. It's one of my earliest memories that just kind of, just kind of like that stuck with me. And I yeah. never told mom and dad because I would have gotten in trouble for going down that alley. You should have been learned, in that alley. Yeah. I, learned, I learned then not to go down that alley. Now, that's a sad yeah. thing. Another happy moment uh, from childhood. I don't know if it's the happiest moment, but it's mm -hmm. one of the happy moments. Like mom and dad didn't have a lot of money growing up. We were not dirt poor, but we were poor. Sometimes yes. the water got turned off. Sometimes the electricity got turned off. Like mm -hmm. people think that what mom and dad have now, that's how we were raised. And like, we, it's truly not, it's not, we were poor, but like we knew it, but we didn't, it was never like that big of a deal to us. I guess right. we just dealt with it, but cause everybody I knew was poor. So every, yeah, really, we truly like, we didn't, <laughs> like, didn't nobody else have nothing. So right. but this, this was a thing. And as I've gotten older, I realized how much they had to scrape and claw to get it. So it's 1988. Mm -hmm. It's Christmas, 1988. Nintendo had come out and I had been asking for a Nintendo. I had no conceptual idea at eight years old right. how much a Nintendo actually cost. So we were at grandma and granddad's house in Richmond. Mm -hmm. And mom or dad told me to go get stuff out the car or something like that. And I go in the trunk and I open up the trunk and there's the box for the Nintendo. And I run into the house and I'm hugging and kissing mom and dad. And it's not Christmas yet, but like, it's like the weekend, the week of Christmas yeah. and like that, that Nintendo meant the world to me. Like mom and dad, even though we didn't have a lot of money, like I always had wrestling men, always had transformers, mm -hmm. you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Uh, but that Nintendo, and now as I got older to realize how much the Nintendo costs, how much mom and dad were making at that particular time. And not only that, but they got me the, the game pad with the track and field and a couple of games that went along with it. Like that was one of my happiest memories from my childhood. Now, do you, are you positive mom and dad bought that? Um, I assume it they wasn't did. Christmas. It was it Christmas. wasn't Christmas. It wasn't Christmas day when you got it. No, I didn't get to open it until Christmas day. It was a but, Christmas gift. Right. But you got it. It was a little early. You saw it early. I saw it early, but it was the week of Christmas. But it was in the trunk of their car. Uh -huh. You know, mom and dad are much better at hiding gifts than that. I think all of our... And then, and then okay. the whole system, trackpad, everything. I think it would be an interesting question to ask. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give mom and dad the credit on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to give mom and dad the credit on that one. I mean, it was just occurring to me while you were asking that question. I was like, how... Did mom and dad get you the Nintendo? Because yeah. we had games, Duck Hunt, and yeah, I, I, the layaway, track pad. Layaway. I mom mean, was dad, notorious for layaway. Mom, mom was notorious was, for layaway. Yes, that and was her. Dad was notorious for materialistic things at the cost of <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we, like the water might be turned off, but we gonna have HBO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't gonna miss Def Comedy Jam. Mm -mm. So, okay, that's fair. You know, yeah. our parents, I think uh, an interesting thing about our childhood, you know, our parents were very young when they, they were children, as far as I'm concerned, when they met. Mom was, mom had just turned 23 and dad was still 21 years old when they had me. Yeah. Um, in college, no money. <laughs> Up until that point had led, not a, they weren't sheltered, but they had, you know, to, to pretty traditional upbringing, two parents mm -hmm. in a house and a, mm -hmm. you know, neighborhood. Dad had yeah. a rougher neighborhood than mom, but, yeah, look. you know, they, of course, had their ups and downs and everything in yep. their homes. Um, but very young to take on three children, <laughs> college, grad school, working, yes. living. Yes. Um, yes. So they, we grew up with our parents mm -hmm. is what I like to say. Um, mm -hmm. We got to see how their work and their perseverance 
really shaped who they became now later in life. Yep. But there were a lot of disadvantages to growing up with your parents, including, you know, them growing up, seeking jobs, moving a lot. Mm -hmm. We were always the new kids in school. Always. Yep. It felt like, um, I think you went to three different high schools, our younger brother. Four different elementary schools, two different middle schools, three different high schools. Yeah. I, I was the only one that went to one high school and I had to fight for that. Yeah. Uh, our younger brother went to two. He had the most, he had, I believe, six elementary schools. Yeah. 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 Always okay. the new kid. How yeah. did moving around frequently shape your perspective on life? Do you think it had an impact on you? Oh, yeah. It definitely had a profound impact. Uh, I think that people that are close to me. Mm -hmm. How do I how do I say this? People that have known me for a long time feel like they don't know me. Mm -hmm. And that's because I didn't realize it, but you couldn't really sustain deep friendships when you're moving all the time. And it's the 90s. There's no internet. There's Yeah, there's no there's internet. There's no cell phones. <laughs> there's when no you cell move, phones. that's it. You that's move. it. And we didn't take small moves. Like we moved, moved. Like you yeah. moved from Illinois to Virginia and then Virginia to Maryland. And it was never like a, a short distance. Yeah. So, um, one thing that it, it it gave me was I have an ability to connect to a variety of different people. Mm -hmm. I, I never had a problem like making friends. Yeah. Now, I don't want a lot of friends because uh, like you could never keep friends. Yeah. So I never had like two of my closest friends right now. They've known each other since they were eight years old. And we're in our forties. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have that type. My relationship is you guys, my siblings. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, it's been a knock for people close to me. It was a knock on my ex-wife. You know, this was mm -hmm. like, you don't get close, and yeah. and I, that's true. Like I don't get close. Uh, you know, brought it up at the top of the the interview. Like a lot of people that have known me for at least a decade don't know where my actual birth date is because I just mm -hmm. wouldn't be like, yes, yeah, it's, it's in July. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just private and uh, distant. But at the same time, it gave me this rare ability that makes me good at my my job that I make, like my major job and, mm -hmm. and this with connecting with people because you, you had to connect with people constantly. And moving. quickly. Quickly and in a completely in different different environments. I went from an all black neighborhood in Illinois to an I was the only black kid, one of two, mm -hmm. two black kids in the entire elementary school in Richmond, Virginia. Yeah. So uh, those dynamics in those different environments uh, that you had to adapt to mm -hmm. made me adapt and makes me able to connect with people from all walks of life. So that's a long winded way of answering that question. No, I think, I think that's true. I think that we are flexible and adaptable. That's a, that's a key uh, phrase in my job. We have, <laughs> we ended up having jobs that require us to be flexible and adaptable. But we also, I think, and I think you'll agree that we exert a certain amount of control over our lives in in a way that we didn't have growing up. And, uh, and I think that the lack of vulnerability is a form of control. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I agree um, with that. Sunday fun day is a form of control. These mm -hmm. are things that you do mm -hmm. so that you know exactly what's going to happen that day because yes. you already have it planned out and it's the same as the last week and the week before that and you don't want to deviate from it so that you have s these pockets of stability. Do you think that's true? Yes. Yes, but also 
I chose to do something for a living and had always chosen whatever my major was, the multiple majors I had, the majors I had in college, mm -hmm. was chaos outside of that. And what I like yeah. to have was controlled chaos. So there is chaos and my schedule, like when I have clients, like things change. So mm -hmm. like my schedule is always kind of in flux, except for that Sunday. Like yeah. I don't really like to deviate from that Sunday. And if I mm -hmm. know leading into it that that Sunday is going to be different than I make it that Saturday or I make it that mm -hmm. Friday, one day mm -hmm. I'm going to get my recharge. So I don't have a whole lot of, I mean, I guess I do. I mean, I can always say if a client wanted to reschedule, no. Yeah. Uh, I tend to not, but yes. But you're used to that chaos. I mean, it's it's a kind of chaos that you are fine with. Yeah, yeah. But I, yeah. but when you say control, like the only thing I would push back on is I don't try to control people. No, you control your environment and yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I would never try to control people. I, I want people to be free when they're around me, to quote yeah. Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you're really allowing that by not being as vulnerable as you could be? or as open as you could be? Allowing what? Are you really allowing people to be free around you? Are you really not controlling that relationship by not even divulging your birth date? Yeah, come on now, this is, this, this. this, <laughs> this, this I said, this is not gonna be a puff piece. I mean, you gave me the questions, you gave yeah, me questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but part of my job is to like look beyond these questions. Yeah. I'm listening to what you say, yeah, and then I'm extrapolating questions from that. Well, uh, <laughs> I guess the way you phrase that question, uh, maybe, maybe. Um, I, ooh, ooh, yeah, I guess. I, mm, okay, yeah, no, I guess it's my control over the relationship. Mm -hmm. It's my control over the relationship. Uh, I didn't realize that until right now, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> me not being vulnerable is me controlling the relationship because at any point um I, I'm not allowing that person to hurt me. Yeah. That's you know it, it hurt me to a certain extent. If I if I halfway let you in, betrayal runs my version of betrayal, everybody's version of betrayal is different. My mm -hmm. version of betrayal uh runs deep. Yeah. And like I get really hurt off of yeah. betrayal and betrayal could be a variety of different things. It could be a betrayal of my, the one main thing is betrayal of my vulnerability. If I'm actually mm -hmm. vulnerable, if I actually let my guard down and like tell you something real and, and, and you kind of like betray that, mm -hmm. uh, you ain't never getting that side of me again, like ever. There's nothing that you could, there's nothing anybody's ever been able to do when they portray my vulnerability. So I guess, yeah, that is, I guess I am controlling. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think that's fair. I think that's fair for anybody if you um give people that kind of access to you and they betray that trust. I think that's I think that's fair. I mean, I think it's okay to forgive someone but not forget and not and know that you can't travel down that road with oh, yeah. that person ever again. I, for, well, I, forgive, I forgive you, yeah, I but forgive I'm people. not going to forget the way that that made me feel. And I mm -hmm. also know that I'm not going to be that person, that version of myself with you anymore. I think that's yep, fair. That's exact. That's me to a T. I forgive people. Like I, it, if somebody tells me, hey, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I it, I instantly, I don't know what it is about me, but I instantly forgive them. Because to me, yes, that takes do. a lot. Yeah, I mean, but whatever. It takes a lot for somebody to say, I'm sorry. And that's really- it Takes a lot for me. Mean, yeah. I know it does because <laughs> you. I think you told me I'm sorry like three times in our lives, and you should be sorry way more than that. But, um, but like, yeah, no. When somebody says I'm sorry, like, school, the relationship is fractured. Mm -hmm. Relationship is not going to be the same. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I won't hold any grudge towards you. Right. <laughs> So I think wrapping up this this section of my questioning. Okay. All right. Um 
you know, like I said earlier, you know, our parents had, uh, growing up with them, it was a journey of watching their growth Mm -hmm. and watching how hard they worked to get to a certain place for not just themselves, like to feel like personal accomplishment for themselves, but also for us as a family. Mm -hmm. How did their journey impact you? How did growing up, watching your parents grow up, impact impact you? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're my heroes. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of strong people in our family that I I really look up to, but the the top two are mom and dad. Like, especially the older I've gotten. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm 42. I'm about to turn 43. And when mom and dad were my age, they had one child, they had one child in college, one about to go to college, and one at high school. Mm-hmm. And I they, cannot personally imagine it. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm just <laughs> looking at the way I live my life right now, and it was like the type of sacrifice. And and we were growing up, and we'd be like, because we were selfish kids sometimes. Mm-hmm. And we'd be like, yeah, y'all, y'all doing this for yourselves. Y'all could be doing this for us. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, yo, the sacrifice that they gave for us Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to give us the things that they did, because realistically, there's only two things in my life that I ever asked for that I didn't get. Yeah. I can't even really remember the second thing. I know there's two things, but the one thing I do remember is that Game Boy. Dad never got me that. I was going to say that. I was going to say that Game Boy. That Game Boy. Dad never got me that Game Boy. And I made those tackles, Dad. You said if I made those tackles in that football game, I was going to get that Game Boy. He said and then it. he was like, okay, if you make these grades on this report card, I'm going to get it for you. And I never got it. But he, he, he made it up by giving me an iPod touch years later. Yeah. But no, it's their strength. Like to, to have a kid. And here's a little thing that I learned as I got older. Kid is not nine months. Kid is basically 10 months. Right? Mm-hmm. So I'm born in July. 40 weeks. I was conceived late October, early November. Mm-hmm. And they met in college. Maybe college starts at the end of August, but most of the time college starts at the semester starts at, yeah, yeah. 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 And it's not like they met on the first day. So they barely knew each other before I was on the way. Mom finally said yes to to Mary and dad because he asked a couple of times and she finally said yes. But it was a, it was a wedding. Like I was there on their wedding day, not born, but I was there. Yeah. I believe they were married in March. Yeah. And to mm-hmm. grow as they were kids. I mean, yeah. they were adults, but they were kids. Yeah. They were still in college. Dad working, mom working at Pizza Hut, dad working at a gas station, you know, student loans, welfare. To get to the point where I'm 20, 20 21 years old and they build their own house. So within yeah. 20 years, they rose from real poverty, like mm-hmm. poverty to building their own four bedroom. I don't know how many bathrooms was in that place, but I don't know. It was like, what was it like 4,000 square feet or something like that? Yeah. It was, it was, something it was, crazy. Yeah. They called it, they called it the, the, the castle, like mm-hmm. family members. They're my heroes because their yeah. work ethic and their drive to get to where they wanted to accomplish and, 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 and to get there, mm-hmm. uh, have, has, whether I realized or not growing up had a lasting impact. And now as an adult, like that, that drives me, Hey, mom and dad had it way harder than I do. Whatever I'm going through, I can make my way through this. Mom and dad did it. And I'm, I'm their blood. So that means that runs through my veins too. That means that anything that I want to do, I can do it. They did it. So yes, they're my heroes. And, and don't I be think, crying, mom and dad, when you listen to this. Whatever. Oh God, you know how emotional they get. Um, yeah, I know <laughs> both of them, and right. that's the crazy thing. It's both of them. Both get of them. extremely emotional, and uh, we're filming this pretty much the halfway point between Mother's Day and Father's Day. So right, right. <laughs> you know, Happy Mother's and Father's Day. Uh, so do you think, in terms of your career path and business, do you think watch, they were a model for the career paths that you've chosen or the way that you've, 
the way that you've dis- made the decision to choose different career paths? Um, no, because mom and dad chose career paths that were secure. Mm. Like they knew they were always going to have a job. I started down that road when I was going to become, when I got my teaching degree, right? Like mm-hmm. I started, that was going to be something secure. I was going to be miserable in that job yeah. Uh, because I need more, I need more chaos. Mm-hmm. I don't need, I can't have something. Being Kids are so chaotic. Fun. I don't know what you. <laughs> no, I, it's a different type of, it's a different type of chaos. Yeah. Like a day and you do the same thing every day. Whereas my job now, I don't do the same thing every day. Kind of, sort of, but I don't. So no, not in, not, what I got from them is their work ethic though. Mm -hmm. That if you're going to do something, go all the way with it. Like that's your goal. Cool. Go accomplish that goal. Uh, So that's, that's what I got from them. Cause they, they were like, this is what we're going to go do. And they went out and they did it. So yeah. in that regard, that's what I got from them. But the actual career path that I've chosen um, doesn't necessarily correlate with, with, with what they chose to do. I think it does. I think that the security that they provided gave us the independence to choose paths that had a little bit more risk involved. Because, But that, but that, but that wasn't your, – your question was – did their choices determine my did, choice? Did watching them, no, not determine your choice. Did watching them influence you? Not, not what, what me watching them influenced my drive and determination and my work mm-hmm. ethic. Mm-hmm. Them always being open to us pursuing stuff, yes. pursuing passions. They let us try everything. They let us try. That's why I'm here. Mm-hmm. Um, because, and I think a lot of it had to do with, look, this is what we had to do because we had a family, but we're giving you guys an opportunity to do something that you actually want and love to do. Yeah. If you can find something that you can make a living, loving what you do, go do that. So that's what I got from them. Because honestly, I remember telling dad, his office used to be right outside my bedroom and he would be working all night long. I had to stuff towels and sheets and shirts underneath the door so that the light wouldn't come through so I could go to sleep because he'd be working. And I'm in, I'm in middle school and high school at this time. He'd just be working. And I told him, I was like, I don't ever want to work that hard. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and it was no slight to him. Yeah. I was just like, nah, the way you work, nah, I don't want that. I don't want to work that hard. Now, even mom I having do. two and three jobs. Yes, our mom entire, child, our entire like, life. life. Yeah. She just stopped having two jobs like two years ago. Like, <laughs> yes. mom always yeah. did that. And I was like, I don't want to work that hard. Now, come to find out everything that I've chosen to do, I actually do work that hard. It's just a little bit different. But uh, yeah, I, I knew I couldn't be a nine to five type person. That's what it was. Yeah. Like, mom and dad, I didn't want to be nine to five. Yeah. Um, and so from them, I got their work ethic. That's That's what I got from them. And and them being open to say, go pursue your dreams that I got from them as well. And you've definitely done that. I mean, I don't know how I even don't know how many majors you had at university. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you, <coughs> you ended up majoring in history, pursuing teaching, mm-hmm. then not doing that. Then yeah. You've been a coach. You've run a, a wrestling company. You've yeah. bartended. You've train people. I mean, you've done a lot of things. And I was even in restaurant current, management. I was in you restaurant, were in restaurant management. management. Yes, I know. Cause I had the, uh, uh, I don't want to say a uh, misfortune of working under you in management, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was your boss. <laughs> yes. You were I my boss, boss at one point. Um, to be in a personal trainer, like what? And even now you have several irons in the fire. Yeah, I got I got a couple things going. What motivated you to explore all these different business ventures? Uh, Why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and how did I get roped into it? No, I'm kidding. But what yeah, did you do? What is motivating you to do all of these different things? If I'm not being creative, it's like a shark. If I'm a shark doesn't move, it dies. If I'm not being mm-hmm. creative, 
if I'm not trying to use, if I'm not using my imagination on something, then Mm -hmm. uh, like I'm miserable. So yes, like even with personal training, like I've been doing this now for 18 years, Mm -hmm. 18 years. Um, Like I don't take on any new clients unless this is a real challenge. Yeah. Like when somebody says to me, uh, I need to get ready for a competition, that's a challenge. They say I need to lose a ton of weight and they're and they're really obese, you know, that's a challenge. If mm-hmm. they have a a condition, like if they, I've, I've trained people that had MS, I trained one of my greatest accomplishments in personal training is I had a woman who had MS. She was like 55, 60 years old at the time. Mm-hmm. And I got her to the point we were working so long and so hard. I got her to a point where she was doing non-assisted, I don't call them girl or boy push-ups or real push-ups. I call them assisted or non-assisted. I got mm-hmm. to a point where she was doing non-assisted push-ups on her own. That's and awesome. I was like, that, that, so that gets, that sense of accomplishment gets me, it's selfish as well, because when they accomplish their goals, I'm like, yeah, you know, I helped you get there. So, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's not completely selfless, but yeah, if, if, if I start to feel stagnant, I've got to go out and do something. Mm-hmm. And yeah, like, you know, I created this dog walking company and it hasn't taken off quite like I wanted it to yet, but that's because, you know, I'm doing four shows a week and getting ready to add another mini micro show for YouTube, but I need to do that. I mm-hmm. need to have that creativity. Um, and starting businesses are fun to me. And helping people start businesses are fun. You know, when somebody hires me to create a website for them or help them develop their business or help them mm-hmm. with their marketing, uh, the ideas uh, of coming up with logos and marketing strategies and, and different different ways that that they could go out and attract customers like that, that gets my juices flowing. So yeah, that to answer your question, if I'm not doing something and something new, I'm a miserable person. And what's the most fulfilling thing to you in all of these careers? Is it helping people? Is it I love helping satis- people. Yeah. I love helping people. Um once again, it's not selfless though. Because it's yeah. helping people. Well, nothing gives really me a- is. I've had this conversation with dad before about selflessness and, and, and I don't know, but um, yeah, it's, it's helping people, but it is also that sense accomplishing some setting out mm-hmm. a goal and accomplishing it. Like that's mm-hmm. the greatest high for me. Yeah. That is, and it could be something simple like that, that time uh, where I decided to drop all that weight. And mm-hmm. I was like, look, I'm 280 pounds. I'm not fat by any means because the way my frame carries it. But I was like, I don't want to keep carrying this weight as I get older. I was like, I'm about to get 40. I want to lean out. And the goal was just to get to under 230. And then to go all the way down to 211 where you thought I was smoking crack. I wasn't. It was just hard work and determination. Okay. It looked suspicious (laughs) because I hadn't seen you. I hadn't (laughs) seen you and it looked suspicious. You were still wearing your old clothes, which exaggerated (laughs) it. And it was suspicious. I was. I was still because I was like, (laughs) oh, I got to go buy a whole new wardrobe. But it's just that it's a sense of accomplishment. It's setting Mm -hmm. a goal and going out there and being like, I'm going to go do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the podcast was something I've been talking about this for like 20 years now in some yes. form or fashion. Yeah. Um, it used to be a internet radio show. Internet that radio. Was the, radio. That yeah. was back, back then in the, yeah. back in the days. Yeah. Back in the but days. It, but it actually started even before then because my influences being in the DC area, because I was so into sports at that particular time, especially when I was in college, Mm-hmm. Michael Wilbon and Tony Kornheiser used to do this show uh, on NBC local mm-hmm. uh, in the Maryland air, area, which was a George Michael sports machine. It was actually a national show. And it was David Dupree, George Michael, uh, not the not the singer. It was a former sportscaster here in the Washington, D.C. Obviously DC not the guy right. from Wham, obviously. Michael Wilbon and Tony Kornheiser. And then Michael Wilbon and Tony Kornheiser spun that off into doing uh, part and interruption on ESPN. And I was like, mm-hmm. that's what I want to do. 
Yeah. I want to be on TV talking about things that I enjoy and things that I love. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why one of my majors in college, after I got out of journalism, when I realized that like I wasn't going to just be a columnist, like I mm -hmm. actually had to go do reporting. I was like, no, I just want to be a columnist. Yeah. Um, was communications because I wanted to go into TV broadcasting. Uh, and you did and so, write for your school paper. I, uh, you, you dabbled. One, I, I dabbled. I dabbled yeah. a little bit. Um, but yeah, I kind of knew that this has been a thing in my head going all the way back to like mm -hmm. 2000, 2001, mm -hmm. which is finally, technology finally gave me the opportunity to really do it. So what inspired you to, to start to finally say, okay, today is the day I'm going to do it? Actually, it's an interview that I still haven't done yet. It's a young lady uh, that was following on Instagram and she had a fascinating story. And Marilyn, you know, I'm talking to you. Um, <laughs> like I'm, I'm putting this out there. I still yeah. want to do this. And you said you've been saying that she's going to do this interview and we text back and forth and we still haven't done it. I'm still trying yeah. to sit down, but now you're, now you've really stretched out and doing bigger things. You might not have no time for me now, right. but it was a young lady. She had done porn, got out of porn. Mm -hmm. uh, and she had a fascinating story about how she got into porn and then got out of porn. It just was a fascinating person. And I was like, you know what? I want to interview you. And she yeah. was like, I'm down for it. And so I started the podcast because of that. So uh, I don't know if this is going to come back to bite me when this podcast blows up because she's the initial, she was the spark. She was the big bang to mm -hmm. be like, she said yes, even though she still hasn't done it yet. She said <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I immediately went out and bought equipment. Yeah. Now, it was the shadiest, shabbiest equipment there is. <laughs> yeah. But I knew that I needed to buy it and get it and get get started. And yeah. then it'll grow. I'd, I'd get it right once I get going, but I just needed to get started. So she was actually the spark because it was something that had been in my head for the longest mm -hmm. time. And she said yes. And I was like, boom, this would be a great first interview. Yeah. And uh, just still hasn't happened. But one day it will. Um, you never know. What? I'm not going to ask anymore. Yeah. You got my number. We have texts. We we have our we have each other's phone number. <laughs> this could happen. <laughs> this could happen. But that was the, that was the that was a spark. And you, sometimes yeah. you need an unusual instance or situation or mm -hmm. person to say, "Go do this now." Yeah. yeah. I think that's a I think that's a good catalyst for getting started. Mm-hmm. Just an interesting the, person saying yes. Yeah. Yeah. It hasn't happened yet, but I mean, eventually. I mean, but that yes led you to say that, yes to yourself. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. That so, yes led me to say yes to myself. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Good, coming up with slogans out here. You know, I have I have I have some pearls of wisdom sometimes I yeah. can contribute to society. So we're 50 episodes in. Mm-hmm. What are some goals that you set for this and have you gotten, have you realized any of them yet? You know, and the, the person that sent this question in, I told him, I was like, that's a really good question because I don't know that I had any goals. Mm -hmm. The goal was to do it. Yeah. Uh, and dad, and for those people that don't know, our dad used to be a pastor. And the one sermon that I remember, the one that stuck with me, is let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you step out there and you take that chance and let it fall where it, where the where it goes. So I didn't have any realistic goals because I didn't know much about podcasting. I yeah. literally just started doing it, and mm -hmm. I said I will figure it out as I go along. So I didn't have any goals initially, mm -hmm. and then me being who I am, once we got started the ambition started taking over and it was like, oh, I don't want to just do audio. I want to do video. Yeah. Oh, I don't just want to just do audio and video. Now I want to put stuff behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. How can I monetize this? Now mm -hmm. let me, let me research into monetizing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is how we monetize it on YouTube. Okay. Let's push YouTube. Okay. Let's push Patreon. Okay. I need to do more clips for promo videos. They need to be better. And the captions need to be better. Let me learn how to do that. Uh, let, I taught myself how to edit. I taught myself not audio and video edit. Mm -hmm. uh, all that stuff gives me excitement. So I didn't have any goals. Now what the goals are, 
huh. the goal is to have an entire podcast and network. My influence, yeah. my influence is, uh, he's a sports journalist, but he doesn't just do sports anymore. Mm. Uh, Dan Lebertard. He's the person you love that you I- some Dan Lebertard. I love Dan Lebertard. He's the person I still, a famous quote is his, I'm not telling you how to think, I'm asking you, would you like to? That's the basic theme of everything that I do, it is stolen from him. And he, during the pandemic, which influenced me as well to, to, to come out here and do this podcast, he left ESPN and he started his own podcasting network and I'm watching him grow and succeed. And obviously he had a different head start than me. It's not a, it's not a competition, it's an influence. Uh, but what he's building, I'm like, I want that too. I want to do that too, but just not solely sports related and he's not solely sports related they've mm -hmm. expanded out but but I want to encompass everything yeah like I don't want any type of entertainment to be deprived of what it is that I'm growing mm -hmm. and it's going to be a podcast network I want there's ways Tubi has every movie in the world I mm -hmm. want to do entertainment as well I see where it's going how long is it going to take to get there? I have no idea. Yeah. But that's the goal now. And I'm not going to stop till we get there. I think that's cool. Um, do I have to participate? Listen, <laughs> <laughs> I think we know I have an aversion to working hard. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, still, uh, guys, I want, even though I'm conducting this interview, this is not my show. This is Bruce's show. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every couple of episodes I have to reiterate this. Yeah, no, but people <laughs> like it when we're both on here. So you stuck. When this thing takes off, you stuck. But you you'll be you're a creative person too. Yes. A lot of y'all don't know that she's not just a photographer, she's a director. Uh, and and the part of that entertainment is gonna be <laughs> saying, Hey Jay, we need to do a movie. Let's uh find some script writers because you're gonna direct it. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I want to do. Work hard. Yeah. I want to live a soft life, and you are not helping me do that. You do a couple of movies a year. You'll be all right. How, how do you see your podcast and your role as host evolving in the future? Hmm. I never want to leave the role as main show host. Cause this like, no matter how far we grow as a network and as I bring in more people to mm -hmm. do podcasts and once I really, really start monetizing this thing, like really getting real money from it. And I bring mm -hmm. in more people to do their podcasts and do their own streaming shows on YouTube or, or other networks or mm -hmm. creating something on Tubi. This is still my baby. I'm going to always do this. What I want to do is get better as an interviewer. Yeah. I want to constantly grow and get better as an interviewer. So I remember one time dad gave me some constructive criticism. He's like, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. I'm like, no, give me as much feedback as I possibly can. Like I, Joshua, this is, this is a shout out to you. Joshua Shea, uh, the porn expert is, was a journalist. Like he wrote for newspapers and magazines, had his own, uh, magazines. Mm -hmm. Um, and like watching, some of the stuff that he's done, I'm picking up on little tidbits on interviewing. Um, so that's one of the main things. I don't, I don't want to be, my interviews have to always be conversations yeah. so that my personality can still be in the interview. Um, but yeah, I want to get better as an interviewer. But also the same thing that I do with uh, everything in life, like, I'm I'm a good organizer and manager. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm going to be overseeing the growth of this thing and the growth of other people um, that I bring into it. Um, and so my role will change, but me as a host, I'm going to always be here and I hope to get better uh, interviewing and speaking better. Stop taking so many arms and pauses and stuff like that. But uh, that'll come. That'll come with more time. We're doing this. Yeah. I mean, but if we're talking about having conversations, oz and ums are just part of that. I mean, that's 
it is part but- of conversation. If we want to, if you want to keep it relaxed and natural and create a safe place for people to open up, then sometimes some ahs and ums are going to be in there. I don't think you should beat yourself That's up true. too much about that. Yeah. Speaking of interviewing, what are what is some of your most memorable memorable guests, and what have you learned from them? There has not been one guest that wasn't important Mm -hmm. and that I wasn't extremely happy to have done that interview afterwards. Yeah. It's funny because some, some people I reach out to to interview, some people come to us to be interviewed Mm -hmm. because they're promoting something. Um, And you meet people and you read, you say, send me a little bio so I can come up with questions if I don't know them. And I'm reading a bio, but then talking to people you just find out these people are so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, There isn't one person that, that sticks out to me because they're all important. I had one of the questions that came in, one of my former clients said, who's your favorite client? And I was like, I don't have a favorite client. Mm -hmm. Like I got, you look at it like, that's like asking a parent, who's your favorite child? Like y'all all mean so much to me. Yeah. All my guests, all the interviews mean so much to me. And they've all been really different. Yeah. The thing that I will say for those people that actually want to learn something as opposed to the shenanigans of me and my sister, though y'all do learn stuff there as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you learn stuff there as well. But the, the interviews are poignant. They're, there's a purpose behind them. Yeah. Like if you listen to the interviews, you will realize that everybody is interesting in their own way. Mm -hmm. And I love having a set of questions and then they say something and I detour and I go down an avenue and be like, wow, that was a nugget that was really, really deep and really, really cool. Thank Mm -hmm. you for expressing that. And that's the reason why I'm doing this interview. Because if people could come on my show and bear out their soul and tell me really private stuff about themselves, why can't I do that for the audience? So would you say that that's, that would be the biggest lesson that you've taken from being yes. an interviewer? The biggest lesson that I've taken from being an interviewer is uh, open up a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. You're a cool no. guy. And I think uh, I think people would be happy to get to know you. Well, I mean, you're my sister. You love me. So of course you're supposed to say that. I uh, love you. And that doesn't mean that I like you. That's, uh, that's completely <laughs> different. <laughs> that's completely different. <laughs> Those are two totally different things. This is well, two I will totally say, different things. I will say that I, I do <laughs> like I do think that I'm cool. Yes. And most importantly, though it took years, mm-hmm. I like myself. And yeah. I especially like the person that I am. Because I'm a much different man than I was five, ten, fifteen, and especially twenty years ago. I like the growth that uh, that I'm that I'm maturing into. Can you think of any particular things that were catalysts for these these growth spurts? You know what? I, I'm going to really give her a lot of credit. My ex-wife. Mm-hmm. Before I met my ex-wife, uh, selfish, self-centered, egotistical, and I had what is known in in our family, this isn't the name that we give it, but I give it the flair. The flair is you get angry and say whatever the hell is on your mind, no matter how hurtful it could be. We do that. Yes. I don't do it anymore. Yeah. The last time I did it, I did it to her when we were just dating. This is before we were actually a boyfriend and girlfriend. And I said something to her and I'm used to saying stuff like that and people combating me Mm -hmm. and she shelled up and begin to cry. And at that moment, I realized what I had said and what I had done. Mm. And so I made it a point, I'm never going to make her feel like that again. Oh, wait a minute. I made her feel like that. How many other people have I made feel like that? They just didn't express it to me right then and there. Mm -hmm. So it was really the calmness and the patience that I dealing with her, uh, because like me, she had severe anxiety. Mm -hmm. Uh, She would go into severe bouts of depression. And when you love somebody, you will do everything that you can to try and and help them and be there for them. So it taught me patience. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so I, I really give her a lot of credit for some of my growth. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of me becoming a man that isn't so wrapped up in himself. Yeah. Other things, I mean, you, you're quick to call me out on my misogyny sometimes because it's a blind spot because I'm, yeah. I'm a man living in a man's world. I don't right. know what it's like to be a woman. Uh, luckily, I've always had female best friends mm -hmm. and, and they've all been very opinionated and will tell me, hey, look, this and that. So it's really the women in my life yeah. <laughs> yeah. is the, the maturity. And I will say the seeds were planted with grandma, mom's mom, mm. because she had been telling me these things since I was a little kid. But when very you very influential one, lady in our lives. So so much. A little a little teeny dynamite <laughs> stick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she had been telling me this is how you treat women. This is how you treat people. Mm -hmm. This this way, this way, this way. But we have so many other influences that are doing other not say I, I was obviously influenced by my environment, whether yeah. it's friends or family, or whatever. Um I acted a certain way. And I would say she was a catalyst of it. Uh, my ex-wife, you, mom, various women that have been in my life have kind of shown me, you know, the way you think sometimes is not the is not the right way to be thinking. Yeah. So how do you think these all these personal the the amalgamation of all these personal experiences and marriage and divorce how have they shaped your perspective on relationships Ooh. Mm. all the things you've learned about how to treat women and the influences of women in your life and how they shaped now being a divorcee well i've been divorcee for a long time so yeah. i mean are you still a divorcee after 10 years you're always you're always divorced. So yeah, I, I, my, <laughs> for ladies and gentlemen, my divorce wasn't recent. That was literally 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, more than 10 years ago, actually. Um, how has it shaped me? In your perspective on relationships and marriage. I'm not opposed to marriage. Uh, I will not. I, we, well, we didn't rush into it. Let's put it this way. And and I, I'm not I'm still not good at this. Mm -hmm. uh, in life, I'm really good at seeing red flags in people, mm -hmm. and being like, okay, I need to keep my distance. But when it comes, I'm such a romantic. Mm -hmm. I'm such a romantic, and part of me is always seeing the best in people. It's that Superman complex, always seeing the good in people that I focus on possibilities. Yeah. That does me well in life for work mm -hmm. and certain relationships, but it does me really poorly in romantic relationships because I see the possibilities as opposed to the realities. Yeah. You should so, never date potential. I'm, I'm king of potential. Yeah. So I would say, I'm not opposed to marriage. I'm not opposed to, to finding that that one person. And I have tried to find that right person. I need to re-examine how I look at things and mm -hmm. stop looking at things from the possibilities and start looking at things from the realities. Because I've gotten into situations where I've stayed in situations longer than I should have because of the possibilities as opposed to realities. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm still... that's. That's still a work in progress for me in general, uh, not just in romantic relationships, but in relationships, period, period. friendships, mm -hmm. all of that, partnerships, businesses. Sometimes you have to look at the reality of the situation and not the possibility. It's great to have that vision of what could be, but also examine what it is. So yeah. it's cool to look to the future, but be present is what I would say that I've yeah. learned. Be present. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to fall into cynicism. I think it's fine to look at things and be like, I wonder what that could be. Like, but yeah, to stay grounded in the present and not be so forward thinking, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Is a good. So, how do you, as a person who doesn't open up, what are some of the ways in which you're trying to in your personal relationships? Or are you trying to? 
I don't know necessarily. That, I mean, this is the first step right here. This is the first step. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I mean, you just you just told people your birth date. This yeah, is I a did. big deal. <laughs> that's, that, that's that's a big deal for me. I don't know. Like, I've conditioned so many of my the people that are close to me, and, and I didn't realize this until some friends of mine were like, "Yeah, you know, you got to give Bruce certain heads up before you." want to do things and this guy don't he doesn't do anything spur of the moment mm -hmm. uh which is not true like i will do things spur of the moment if i'm already been drinking then everything is fun to me. but <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh yeah so people people around me curtail themselves to my personality which is wrong mm -hmm. so for those of the people that are out there doing that challenge me a little bit more yeah uh, that's, I mean, I need people to challenge me more. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also when they do challenge me, I need to not fall into the shell. People don't realize that this personality that you see, that that is me, but also I'm very, very reserved uh, sometimes, mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. of times, introvert, extrovert, extrovert, introvert, whatever it's called, that's that's who I am. Yeah. Uh, so I guess people, got, people that are close to me got to put the pressure on me. Yeah, and you know I'll try, I'll try, but it... also it gets to the point where this is kind of who I am. Yeah, like I'm almost forty three years old. Like I've changed a lot in my personality, but some things just aren't going to be changed. Just aren't changed. Like I'm gonna probably always be guarded. Yeah, uh, that does not mean I won't get to a point where I will be vulnerable. Mm. Uh. But it that that takes a long while to get to that point. And some people think that they get there quicker than they actually do. And I'm just like, oh, you you know, this ain't this ain't what it what you think it is quite right. Yet. Right. But, well, I mean, nobody's asking you to be vulnerable with a hundred percent of the people that you meet. I think that's dumb. Um, but can you teach an old dog new tricks? Absolutely. It just requires positive reinforcement. I don't understand yeah, why that why that saying is even exists. You can absolutely yeah. teach old dog new tricks. You can. I think I think it's uh finding the people in your life that you feel safe with and you feel like I could open up to this person and they'll respect and honor where I'm coming from and then just start there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We'll get there. Some people some people out there no matter how much I try to hide, they actually see me. Somebody sent me something on Instagram earlier today. And it was like, this made me think about you. This made me think of you. This mm -hmm. is who you are. And I was like, hmm. Yeah, people normally say the opposite about me. But yeah, that's exactly who I am. You actually see me. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. So last question. All right. How do you, how do you feel? Last question. How do I feel? I feel good. You feel all right? That this is yeah, the I last feel all right. Question. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, I feel good. So looking back on your journey so far, what are some of the most significant lessons you've learned about life and yourself? Jeez. Uh, the significant lessons. Huh. Okay. People will tell you who they are. Mm -hmm. um, things are not always about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love hard because you can lose it in an instant. Very true. Tell people what they mean to you because mm -hmm. you never know if it's going to be the last time you talk to them. Also very true. Yes. And live like there is no tomorrow because no matter what we attain here materialistically, we can't take it with us. Yeah. So I'm not reckless with money, but I can save a little bit more. But you know what? I'm not going to take it with me. And I don't know when my last breath is going to be. So if I really want to do something, I'm not going to deprive myself of that. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, when my life flashes before my eyes, I would rather have way more happy moments mm -hmm. than sad. And the only way that I could do that is do what makes me happy as long as I don't hurt anybody in the process. You're going to get all the pearls of, of wisdom on that, on these uh 
This interview, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to get all the early bird catches the worm. <laughs> no, I didn't say that because I'm not trying to get up early. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, definitely don't do that. When you lay down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. Mm -mm, that's not true. <laughs> one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> you gonna get them all? <laughs> well, you know what? I appreciate this. I think I think I was a good person to conduct this interview. I don't know if you would have been this forthcoming with anybody yeah. else. <laughs> way, way to give praise to yourself. One yeah. thing my sister will always do is give praise to herself. Listen, who's gonna toot my horn except for me? No, Nobody. you were the perfect person. That's the reason why yeah. I chose you because you 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 are the person that presses me. Mm -hmm. You press me. Dude, I'll never forget the one time you was like, who, who are your favorite actors? And I'm naming all these men. And you're like, not one female? <laughs> and I was like, oh, damn. Like, I didn't think of it like that. Just blind spot. So I'm yeah, still I challenging mean, you to watch Hidden Figures. I think you'll really enjoy that film. And Jay it was it was just on TNT. It has nothing the other to do night. with the movies. It's just sitting down watching an actual movie. Well, get your get your iPad so you can have some other stimulus because <laughs> you clearly can't sit still. That's the one still. thing you'll learn, ladies and gentlemen, that Bruce will drive 10 hours down to Atlanta <laughs> by himself. It wasn't by help, myself. You help, was in the car. I was sick. And so I was useless. He'll <laughs> listen to Dan Leptard the whole way. The whole way. <laughs> he'll cut, he'll move a washer and dryer when he gets there and still want to go out. This man has boundless energy. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I'm pretty sure I turned my volume down, but my phone is still Wait. going off. So I, it is what it is. All right. Well, I appreciate you uh, sitting down for this interview. And I appreciate you conducting the interview. You wrap up the show. This is your show. You wrap it okay. up. Okay. Well, I mean, on that <laughs> note, <laughs> on that note, thank you. To all the audience out there, thank you. We'd love to hear your feedback. Throw some feedback in the comment section on the YouTube page. Yeah. Subscribe to the YouTube page. Share, like, comment. Uh, thank you for listening. This is just the beginning. Like I told you, we're only going to grow further. And I appreciate you rocking with us. Until next episodes, time. 50 episodes. That's right. 50 episodes. Bananas uh, to me. Uh, but until next time, I'm a holler. Thank you for listening to Unsolicited Perspectives with Bruce Anthony. Please subscribe, like, comment, share, and donate. Donations help us keep giving you this free content each and every week. Until next time, Audi 5000. Peace.